Hi everyone, welcome back to NERV. And if it is your first time joining us, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture, and our aim is to bring neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. Who we are is Davi, myself, and Siobhan, and Siobhan and I will be your hosts for the evening. First off, we have a very exciting announcement. So the Oxford Machine Learning Summer School will take place from 9 to 10 August, and the summer school aims to provide its participants with best in-class training oh, sorry, on the broad range oh, of advanced go. topics and Yes, sorry, was I, oh, I no, breaking up? Your, your slides hadn't caught up to you, um, but we can see them now. Okay, perfect. Cool, is it all? Okay, all caught up. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, so the Oxford Machine Learning Summer School um, provides training in a broad range of topics and developments in machine learning and deep learning. So the school will cover some of the most important topics in machine learning and deep learning that the field is showing a growing interest in. For example, Bayesian machine learning, representation learning, computer vision, natural language processing, reinforcement learning, casual machine learning, and sorry, causal machine learning and transfer learning. So um, yes, that is our announcement. Then we have two events in the spotlight. So just I'm just going to give it a second to, to catch up if the slides are maybe behind, but it seems like they're good. Um, so today we would like to place two grassroots organizations in the spotlight. Masakane's mission is to strengthen and spur natural language processing research in African languages for Africans by Africans. And despite the fact that 2,000 of the world's languages are African, African languages are barely represented in technology today. The tragic past of colonialism has been devastating for African languages in terms of their support, preservation, and integration. This has resulted in technological space that does not understand our names, our cultures, our places, and our history. Masikane roughly translates to we build together in Isizulu, and their goal is for Africans to share and own these technological advances towards human dignity, well-being, and equity through inclusive community building, open participatory research, and multi multidisciplinarity. Then, secondly, if you are interested in joining a budding community focused at the intersection of healthcare and artificial intelligence in Africa, please do join the conversation on Discord today. And then Siobhan will be sharing all of these links in the comments as we speak. Then, just a couple of house rules. Please use respectful and inclusive language on our platform. Then also remember to ask a question during our speaker's presentation and remember to post questions in the ask a question section of the crowdcast. Then also remember to vote for your favorite question because the favorite question is likely to be our first. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where we will invite you on screen to ask your questions live. If you don't have a mic, don't worry about it. Or if you don't want to come online because of connectivity issues, also don't worry about it all the questions on the bar if you simply add but please do take note we will assume you will be coming up to ask a question if you do not add please off. then lastly though try to refresh your browser alternatively you can select the compatibility mode from your visual oh uh, we've lost julianne um but that is not to worry. Um, can everyone still hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. I am going to then continue with the introduction and then uh, we can let uh, Conrado start his, his talk. Uh, please let me know in the comments if I disappear as well and then we can regroup and carry on from there. So uh, it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Conrado Bosman. Um, Dr. Bosman received his medical degree from the University of Chile in 2000 and his PhD from the Catholic University of Chile in 2005. Since 2011, he has been an assistant professor at the Cognitive and Systems Neuroscience Group within the Swammerdam Institute for Life Sciences at the University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on the study of long-range neuronal communication and multi-century integration mechanisms in health and disease. This is done by using combined multi-scale recordings ranging from neuronal ensembles to cortical LFP. 
Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you for your invitation, Sean, and, um, uh, um, and also uh, thank you everyone to be here. So I'm going to share my screen, which I hope I'm doing correctly. Um, let me know, you, you, I guess you see, see my screen now? Uh, do I, yes. Do I, okay, perfect. So, um, so as uh, Siobhan uh, mentioned, I'm uh, working at the University of Amsterdam and uh, my research is involved uh, as related to electrophysiology and uh, I like to combine um, the two types of recording, local feed potentials and spike recordings in order to try to understand the, how the, the, the functional organization of neuronal circuit and how that relates to behavior. And I would like to sh uh, show you some of the things that I'm doing here uh, today. Well, let's, uh, let's start then. Um, okay, so just to put you in, in, in the context of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about perception and brain states. Probably everyone uh, understands what I prefer with perception. So we have a picture like, like, like I'm showing here in, a, in the screen, this, this, this uh, uh, fruits here. Of course, there is uh, some form and colors and uh, stimulation that goes to the brain and then it gets processed. And that is something that everyone can understand. Probably less clear is that this, that process is, doesn't occur as uh, always the, the same way because the brain as a complex machine has a, as an internal organization and an internal dynamic and that dynamic can change across time and that brings to that uh, perception some variability and that is what we call the, 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 the way that we can study this variability is to observing behavioral states and behavioral states range for a wide range of behaviors that I would say are more general. I, I represent some sort of a predisposition to do something um, in the world and that represent a, a, a particular brain state. And this is what I wanted to show here. So brain state can go from, from the, can um, range a uh, wide um, uh, spectrum of behaviors. You can be attentive, you can be uh, uh, sleepy, or you can uh, be really uh, being, uh, um, uh, sleeping com completely. And of course, that will change how the brain will process the incoming in, uh, information. Um, so this is what I, 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 I would like to, to study. And as I said before, there is, a, is an, an ample range of uh, behavior that um, uh, will, of course, uh, be uh, 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 limited or modulated by the, the, the brain state. And, and I could say, for instance, you can see here uh, as someone that is sleep completely uh, is sleeping. So the, the, the and as I said before, the way that this person will, will uh, or the, her brain will process the, 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 the incoming information is very different of the way that it could be this person here that needs to be very attentive and very focused on what he's doing. And we have a wide uh, range of, um, of uh, uh, states here. And one of those, what is very interesting is the, I would call the commuter state or, or in a state of quiet wave clinics that probably um, everyone of you has been experienced in which you can be relaxed and uh, your perception is not such focused and attentive as it should be, but still you are pretty aware of things that it happen. Probably this picture this is too much because it really looks like this is sleeping. But there is also, let's say, a pathological state of, or, or a pathological size of these brain states, and that are represented by what we call consciousness disorder, or disorders in which your um, level of awareness um, is uh, um, altered because of certain um, underlying pathology. And that could go from 
the, the, the complete coma in which you are almost no um, or little uh, functional activity um, until a, st a stage in which you are not necessarily unconscious, but your connection to the external world change. And I will show you some, some a, a very interesting example about that. So now the question is, how these brain states are modulated through dynamical changes across the cortical column? And when I refer cortical column, I, I refer to um, an anatomical and functional organization of the cortex, which is very uh, relevant for computations. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with, uh, with the neuroscience, but of course we always talk about the neurons as the unit of information, and that is certainly true, but, but until certain point, because neurons are not isolated, neurons are connected, and the connections are not random or all to all, the connections follow a particular architecture, and uh, this architecture is very re relevant in the cortex. We know that the cortex is separated in, in, in layers, we call these cortical layers, and uh, these layers as um, there are different neurons that are spread across these uh, 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 laminar organizations, and we have, uh, 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 for instance, uh, a layer in which incoming informations from subcortical structures are, are enter into the cortex and then for them that goes to certain pyramidal cells that are either in layer, layer two three or layer uh, five and that is what then it connected either to other cortical uh, columns in the same area or are connected to subcortical structures or even can go to far range of the uh, cortical structures and all this circuit is in certain way modulated by the activity of these tiny cells that are called, called interneurons, which role is inhibitory and um, well, then it can, um, uh, they can uh, 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 regulate the activity of these pyramidal cells. So we know about those uh, things, but um, the question is how can we study the effect of these dynamical modulations and the role in behavior. So there are many ways to do it. There are many techniques. But what I'm going to focus today is in the, in the, in the, in the techniques that has to do with electrophysiology. And for electrophysiology here, I, I wanted to show um, different levels in which we can record the uh, electrical activity of these uh, neurons and group of neurons. Of course, Probably you are familiar with the uh, MEG or the EEG, which is a non-invasive way to study a mass uh, or, or a, 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 a massive amount of neurons and their combined activity together. And what we obtain with the EEG is, is um, a, a much more broader uh, met metric of something that we also can get more locally using either electrocorticograms that are more close to the surface or microelectrocorticograms. And that, um, that are, as you see here, almost um, getting the combined activity of the, uh, of the entire microcolumn. That activity is what we call the local field potential, which we can define as a weighted average of the activity of all the neurons that conform a certain piece of, of, of a part of the tissue. Of course, we also can measure uh, the isolated activity of neurons or the combined activity of certain neurons, and then we can have an idea of how this circuit is organized. On the one hand, we can, we can use the LFP to try to understand global changes and how the, all these global changes are affecting different areas of the brain and whole of information is broadcast, broadcasted. Uh, to different areas, but also can we um, evaluate the activity of how that global activity are uh, modified or modulated the activity of single cells. And then we have this sort of some sort of circular um, activity in which you can get the uh, uh, you can study the neurons that are part of that circuit and you see you can evaluate their behavior um, in the context of this uh, 
uh, more global modulation and also see how that affects the, the this act in, in, in activity of individual neurons can affect also global modulation. So, and that is what I wanted to say here that the local free potential is, you can, this is a typical LFP trace, very similar. it's the same as the EEG, just is much more local. And um, here you see a very uh, old fashioned uh, depiction of the cortical microcolon. And the, the, the key message here is that the LFP uh, captures this key integrative synaptic processing. And that uh, integrative synaptic processing, um, it cannot be measured only by looking one neuron at a time. Um, and I think that is what it makes important to, 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 to have a complete overview of the activity of the single cells, but also the activity of local field potentials. Um, the activity of local field potential in, in certain ways is hard to, to, is easy to measure, but it's hard to interpret because uh, since it combines and it's a weighted average of activity that can be local, but it can also uh, be a ref uh, reflection of connection from other areas, um, it, it made it, um, their interpretation sometimes difficult. And there is a, in the literature still a lot of debate at how we can interpret that. But one of the things that we know that it is for sure is that the LFP is but it's an uh, it it's mostly a periodic signal. It's, it's, that means we can study their oscillatory components there. And if you um, are familiar, probably you are familiar with the Fourier spectral decompositions that allow you to to understand what oscillations are part of this um, signal. And one way to study that is 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 what I wanted to show you here. So, for instance. If we have um, an animal or a subject that is uh, doing a task, in this case, just watching this picture of oranges and following the dynamic of how this person study the, the, the orange or, or, or animal by follow, following the, the, the eye movement, well, we see here that we, we have a task and we can then correlate the, 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 what they are doing, the behavior, with the activity of, uh, of the LFP recorded, let's say, with an electrocorticogram. And then you can immediately see here the raw LFP signal that you have a baseline when uh, there is um, uh, nothing on the screen, just a fixation point, which is quite stable. But once the stimulus appears uh, in the screen, uh, you start to see that there are a prominent activity of certain high frequency oscillation. You don't need to make an analysis here to, 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 to come with that uh, conclusion. But uh, you see here the high frequency oscillations. And also you can see that when there are saccades or ocular movements, this um, amplitude of this high frequency oscillation goes down until there is again some stability and you can see that again. So, Okay, we see this in LFP, but how can we study that? And probably you know about that because you have a, an engineering background. For me, when I studied this my, uh, after the medical school, it was uh, um, all, almost kind of magic, but by using a Fourier analysis or Fourier decomposition techniques, you can take your complex time series here, your complex uh, signals, and decompose on and, and, and observe what are the frequencies or, 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 or oscillations that uh, compound that signal. And you, of course, can see that um, you will see uh, in, the, in, the, in the LFP signal a particular type of, of, um, of, of uh, uh, spectrum, which is a, uh, one, one, 1 over F, which is shows a, a, a deployment from high high energy or power at lower frequencies to low energy at higher frequencies. But every time that you see a bump uh, over this one over F uh, type of signal, then you know that you have, uh, you are evaluating um, a particular oscillatory component on the signal. And in this case, you can see that these traces um, show an 
activity around 40 to 80, 90 hertz, what we call in electroencephalography uh, uh, the gamma frequency band. And yes, you can do that analysis, and then you can, of course, you can take time series, this series and separate it uh, in time windows. And then, of course, you can calculate the Fourier inside of that time window and superimpose all the time windows together to have a time frequency representation of the trace. So it can capture the dynamic of, uh, of, the, of the phenomenon. And here you see in this type of plots that you have the power um, at different frequency bands across time. And then you can see here, once we have the, stim the stimulus onset, you see then this increase of the high frequency components, which of course, when there is a saccade, it goes down to stabilize it again. So we can say then that the oscillations are an essential part of the LFP signal. And then we can use this, uh, um, the, the activity of the oscillation to, to really characterize what are the LFP. We can do other stuff to not only get the power. And one of the things that I, 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 here I'm, I'm only presented very uh, in a very um, broad view is to try to understand relation, uh, phase relationships. Um, and these phase relationships, um, though that means that when you have your signal here, you can obtain not only the amplitude or the power, but also the phase of that oscillation. And um, I try to represent that here by uh, filter the signal between a particular frequency band here between 30 and 35 hertz. But of, of course, you can, from this information, you can extract some sort of angle that, that tells you what is the phase of that particular signal, where that signal have the peak and where they have the throw. And of course, then if you have two signals with these two, two, two um, phase components, you can do things like to study phase difference across these signals. And if you observe that these phase difference are uh, constant across time or constant across trials, um, then you can infer that there is a relationship between these two uh, EEG or LFP uh, traces. Also, you can use this to study um, LFP with spikes. That means to understand or to, to know where, in which part of the cycle of these oscillations, your spikes have, um, are, are present. And that is relevant because, of course, um, you can say that if there is no relationship between the phase of an EEG or an LFP signal, um, then a spike will, the, the probability of having a spike will be more or less equally distributed across the, the whole cycle. But if there is a phase a relationship of the spiking activity of a particular neuron with this LFP, you will see a concentration of the phases at a particular, um, a concentration of the spikes at a particular phase of the cycle. And that is something that we can study using techniques as a, a coherence analysis or um, others a little bit more elaborated, which I'm going to talk about later. So these are, in, in a nutshell, the tools that we have to study the LFP and the, and the, and the interaction with, with the spikes. Now, uh, I think it's worth to mention that um, in, in our lab, we have a, a multi-species approach. We studied um, several species and how all this uh, um, perception occurs. And um, we also use that data to create models and simulations of that and probably you are familiar with if you assist to the uh, um, to the talk previously given by dr jorge mejias um, so but this multi-species approach also has a an, um, as an uh, the idea is to 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 see what are this, the the similarities or what and make this species difference and put this in an evolutionary context and now I'm going to present some of the results of this idea of how to study brain states um, in humans and ferrets and mice, if I have enough time. And every one of these experiments provides us some sort of idea of um, uh, that relationship. So I want to st 
start with showing to you something that it's it it is um, um, I think for me it, it was very interesting. So uh, when you have a, a, a patient and and a patient has a disorder of consciousness, of course you can uh, doing an EG and or or have to try to have an idea of clinically what is happening with with the patient. But of course sometimes it's not so easy because it's not really very clear. For, for doctors and clinicians when it happens. Um, and um, you can study the, the disorders of consciousness, but also there are neurological pathologies that are not necessarily uh, going to um, add an, an alteration of uh, consciousness in, in, the, in, the, in the level of awareness. A patient can be aware, but it can have several problems to communicate. And that has happened to certain patients, and I will describe here a clinical case and how we did the study of the LFPs and try to understand how the, 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 the behavioral state here is motivated by uh, or is determined, determined by, by the disease and how certain drugs can alter that and also can alter the behavior. So uh, we recently, with the colleagues of the uh, Amsterdam UMC, or the Amsterdam Me Medical Center, uh, or the Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam, we uh, find a, a patient that uh, was quite remarkable. And I, I will explain what it happened. So this was a 29-year-old man, which suffered an uh, episode of um, ischemic, uh, epoxic ischemic brain injury. And the patient, um it, it 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 went to a uh, critical care unit treatment and they have some sort of neurological recovery but that reached a very early plateau so the patient couldn't move spontaneously and there were no speech and there was a severe impairment of his arousal and it was very uh, difficult to keep him um in a wakeful state and there were no lesions, uh, structural or anatomical lesions, when you study the CT scans or the MRI, and also no, no evidence of epilepsy, nothing that can explain that. It was just simply that the noxia produces it, it, this kind of general um, um, uh, dysfunction of the cortical activity. And uh, when uh, the patient was evaluated by the, uh, the clinical team for this study. There were no sign of a spontaneous speech uh, or vocalization on request. Um, it could do certain movements and respond to certain commands, but there is a very severe latency of response, muscle rigidity, etc. So this type of evolution is consistent with the pathology that is called akinetic mutism, which is um, uh, a severe disorder of diminished motivation, as you will see here. Now, the interesting thing of this patient, more, the, the, the general population of this patient, unfortunately, they have not little uh, what you can offer as a clinician because there is nothing that they will uh, make change. But there is a subpopulation of patients that have a, what we call a paradoxical response to a drug that is called sulpidin. And probably Probably you are familiar with sulpidem. Sulpidem is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a drug that is used to induce sleep. It's a sleep pill, uh, similar to the diazepam, and it has the same chemical um, properties. Is a it acts as an agonist of GABAergic receptors, so it has to do uh, something with the activity of interneurons, and it has in normal people, it has a, a hypnotic properties. So you take one of these pills, you will feel sleepy, you want to go to sleep. But some of these patients have the ability to respond to sulpidem paradoxically. Uh, they really awake using the drug. And these mechanisms of actions are not known yet. And to show you how it works, I, I would like to show you a video about that. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can... Um, yeah, so I'm going to put a video, please. I hope you can see the video. Uh, if you can confirm this to me in, in the screen, it would be nice. If you see the video. Yes, we can see the video. Okay. So 
this is the patient and I don't want to spend all the time it's a little too long but here you see that his his um this is that's the way that he is uh, um, uh, most of the time. Um, and can you mouse your hand? Give it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's prima, hoor. Can you your stem is laten horen? Laat je stem eens horen. Kun je eens laten zien wat je met de tandenborstel doet? Laat maar zien, hoe moet dat? Zometeen krijg je de sulpidem en dan hoop ik dat je daarna makkelijker kunt praten en misschien dat ook die opdrachten beter lukken. Nou, Jus, mag ik je even plagen? So we have now the sulpidem, and after some time, you see what it happened with the patient. Soms lijkt het erop dat je niet goed kunt praten. Voel je dat ook bij de cellen? Ja. ja. Dus je merkt wel eens dat je niet goed kunt praten. Ja. En hoe is het nu? Hm. Ik denk niet veel veranderd. Voor je, voor je gevoel is er niet zoveel veranderd. Mm. Nee. nee. Merk je ook wel eens dat het lastig is om te bewegen zoals je zou willen? Mm. Merk je wel eens dat bewegen moeilijk gaat? Mm. Nee. Niet echt. Nee. Heb je, heb je sowieso klachten van je gezondheid? Nee. Nee. Nou, gelukkig maar. Ja. Ja, daar ben ik blij om. En wat is dit? Een pen. En wat is dit? Mijn tandenborstel. En hoe gebruik je een tandenborstel? Ja, moet er nog iets op? Tandenborstel. Ja. So you see then that the patient with the use of sulpidem has a very different uh, behavior. So he can really um, he can really connect and he can really then answer questions and he can even move. And this is something that you don't see when uh, the patient is uh, is uh, without the effect of, of the drug. Of course, after the the, the, the effects of the drug fade, fade down. Uh, patients, the patient back to their original state, and um, it, it cannot be used so so often because then he developed tolerance to that. So it's using this uh, so for a very particular moment when he has received visits from the family and um, um, when he has had medical appointments, things like that. The point is that how how can we um, so having the opportunity to, to, to study this patient and try to do some analysis of, of, of the uh, electrical activity elicited by, by, by the brain before and after the sulpidem can help us to understand what, uh, what, um, how this behavioral or these brain states changes in such a way that um, produce such a uh, um, change of behavior. So what we, what we did was to... Um, Take the, um, uh, and in this case it was an EEG, of course, 
cannot be possible to do uh, a more invasive measurements in the patients and uh, have a, um, a, a, um, a, a recording a, a period of time before the, act, the use of SOLPDM and after the use of SOLPDM. And uh, then here you see how that uh, looks like the, the, the power spectrum, in this case, in the central activity and here in the topographic activity. And one of the uh, important things here is the shift of the frequencies, how you see that from the pre them and a very predominant activity at, at, at low frequency component below 10 hertz, it goes to um, uh, more uh, the prevalence of higher components like it, um, beta and um, also gamma. Um, so, and, and here you see the topography, which uh, shows that, um, for instance, the, 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 the pre-activity theta, then how it's more central and go down, same as alpha, but then you see this increase on the beta and gamma activities. Um, of course, that can tell us something about the prevalence of or the incidence of certain rhythms and how they change, but it didn't say too much, of course, about how the, there is the interactions of different areas and, and the interaction of, um, of, uh, of, of this rhythm in, 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 a, in a circuit. So to try to uh, approach to that, we, we did a, a second analysis in which we use a measurement of connectivity. In this case, we use um, we focus it not on 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 um, on a phase interaction, but amplitude envelope correlations across different uh, uh, channels. We did this with an EEG, but also with an EMG to have a a, a better sampling of the activity. And uh, uh, what it was very interesting is when we focus the uh, the amplitude embedded correlation and this is an, an average across all the channels we see that despite the fact that there is an increase of uh, that the SOPDM produce an increase of power what we're seeing is that the um, power the, the amplitude correlations uh, post SOPDM uh, at the beta frequency decreases SOPDM reduce the amplitude envelope correlations at beta band and then you see here that uh, in the EEG but and, uh, here at the EMG, and this to compare that how how it is with 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 uh, with controls, which is uh, measures some uh, normal subjects. Um, we get one measure here, and then we see how the uh, the the activity of, uh, of beta mimics uh, the post activity of the patient, mimics the, of the amplitude envelope correlations at beta of the controls. Unfortunately, we did not get in this particular experiment a comparison in which the, these uh, controls have been uh, in, uh, taking um, uh, a SOPI them themselves to see how these changes occurs in, 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 the, in the controls. But still, it's um, interesting to see that this activity is reduced. Now, um, that um, could be counterintuitive because you would expect it, that there is more integrations uh, on, 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 on the activity of uh, a normal subjects, and here we see a decrease. But it is worth to mention that what we're using here is um, a, a met methods that are really uh, global. And what we're seeing here is that sometimes when you have a, a that, that integration can be uh, detrimental if it is global and it is not able to really uh, decrease uh, or to, to show uh, to, 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 to be um, create form of communication that is specific to certain areas. And I think that is something that is, is relevant here and um, there are other, um, not only with uh, patients with akinetic mutation, but also with other type of patients uh, that shows that that sometimes this increase on beta activity can be um, related to some sort of uh, dysfunctional uh, cortical subcortical communication that can um, uh, uh, lock the activity of the cortex to this particular 
um, frequency band and does not allow the uh, uh, function uh, microcircuit to, 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 to function on a more um, a specific task and in a more in a more different fashion. So to, to, to resume this part of the talk, um, what we, we observed here was a decrease in theta power and increase in beta. And this is consistent with power signatures uh, changes in other neurological disorders, but also SOP then decreases functional beta connectivity throughout the, the brain. And we think that this is pretty much related to a thalamocortical dysrhythmia. One important thing now is that by using uh, deep brain stimulation, um, we can control and we can try to uh, reduce this pathological high connectivity in beta. That means we can in, um, uh, uh, implant an electrode that can produce in certain uh, subcortical structures some stimulation and therefore uh, um, uh, 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 try to disrupt this, uh, uh, this high uh, uh, frequency, um, beta frequency um, uh, connectivity. And now the patient, um, the family of the patients give consent to implant an, an electrode on, on a particular subthalamic uh, nucle, uh, nucleus and uh, use it as a, as a deep brain stimulation. And um, yeah, that is the second part of the story that I hope I'm, um, we are collecting data at this moment when the patient is in a phase of trying to establish what is the right doses to do this um, um, simulation. And once we obtain that, we are going to uh, do the same type of analysis that I show you here with solpidem to see whether this activity also mimics um, the activity of solpidem and also we can see changes in the behavior of the patient. Okay, um, I, I think I'm going to answer the questions at the very end so you can put, put your questions in the, in, in, in the text and yeah, that will be, will be, will we have time to discuss more about that. Um, for now, I would like to show you some, a little bit some, uh, or the different approach that we have. And this is not now to study some, some uh, pathological state, but to study normal state. And as I said before, we have this uh, spectrum of uh, behavior, uh, brain states and be behavioral correlates that go from the non-REM sleep to active wakefulness. But in the in the in between, then we have this period of quiet wakefulness, which is a stage in which the animal of the subject is awake, but it's not displaying any active behavior. So we expect it to have uh, shared features of both active wakefulness and deep sleep. And when it, it's interesting to see how these transitions occurs and what these transitions are telling us. So in order to study that. We, um, together with Leanne Clava, a PhD student here at the lab, we um, tried to study then the difference in brain state across different periods of quiet wakefulness and if there's any functional specification across neuronal subtypes. And for that, we use uh, awake ferrets, um, passively stimulated uh, using uh, full contrast gradients so and visual stimuli. Why we use a, a ferret, you will, uh, would like to ask. Um, and the, 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 the answer to that is um, because ferrets, despite the fact that are, um, so you can see here the, the carnivora order, which belongs to the ferrets, are rather far from the humans uh, compared to mice or rats, for instance. Nevertheless, a car carnivora and the primates shares a very similar architecture of the visual cortex. The visual cortex is organized in these um, cortical columns of um, the, the uh, orientation columns. And this pattern is very well um, conserved across these, uh, the, despite the fact that these two species are uh, separated. So, um, and that this could be a case of convergent, of evolutionary convergence. So, we decided then to use the third. Uh, we, we wanted to, 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 to try to make, um, a, um, to understand how the, 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 the system, the visual system of the primates works 
uh, it's good to have a model in which we can we, we, we share many of the, the, the features. So we study the ferrets, and for that we, we have uh, recordings of the ferrets in area B1 and parietal area, and we also study the pupil, pupil changes of the of, of, of the ferret while they are uh, um, seeing uh, activity on a screen. And why the pupil? Because the pupil changes can tell us about how then um, uh, it, 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 of course, it will react to the, the luminance of the, of the room and the stimuli, but also it can tell us about how the, uh, the, the behavioral state of the, of the subject is at that moment and that how it correlates with the brain state. So what we have then is, is just to get a, a, a pupil diameter of uh, by and that we did by using this camera counting the pixels of the eyes of the ferret across the whole session here you have 30 seconds and then we take different uh, uh, we just presented passively this stimulation but in the meantime we just simply got the the uh, the, the raw traces and for those raw traces um, in across long sessions in which we have a period of a baseline period and then a period of stimulations in which we presented this grating across multiple orientations, then we obtained the pupil, the pupil trace. And then to, in order to, to understand how then that activity changed, we focused on the pre-stimulus so, uh, period of the pupil trace, just before the onset, the, the onset of the grating. And when that happened, uh, we take this and uh, we did then, uh, we, we take all the pre-stimulus pupil traces and we create some sort of histogram of uh, pre-stimulus pupil size and for that we separated in quintiles and then we identified the, the, the lower and the highest quintile. And, and then, so we, in, in that sense we were able to see what was the state of the animal previous to the visual perception, previous to the stimulation and all the process of visual perception in two different states, which were not so different in terms of, of the behavior of the animal, because the animal was awake, but at least we were able to quantify those um, changes. And then, of course, we compare both. So we get uh, here the, what we call the low, um, uh, um, we, we call low and high by, by this state in which you have a, a lower diameter and a higher diameter, which of course, correlate with the level of arousal of the animal at that time. And here we superimpose the two uh, pupil traces. And you see that, the, uh, of course, the traces are uh, uh, here is normalized that I can superimpose. And you see that the, the traces are not so much different in time. But then it's uh, interesting to see then what happened with the uh, brain activity. And for that, well, we take these, these, these uh, two uh, periods and we correlated with the activity of LFP signals at, uh, uh, and spikes that we can obtain from two different visual areas. Area 17, which is area V1, and area PPC, or posterior parietal region, and an area that is higher in the hierarchy of visual system and is more related to integration of information. Uh, the very first thing that we did was to, 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 to uh, see whether we have really a, 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 a nice signal to study. So we did just simply an, uh, an EOP, and then we, find, we f uh, found the, the normal um, N1, N100, P100 uh, components of the EOP, and we didn't see too, too much of a difference between these two components. But when we study the power, then we see certain differences. You know. So in these power traces, um, you don't see the one over f activity because it was subtracted. But already, it is possible to see here uh, that first of all, we take the baseline, which is in black, and then the stimulus in in in, in green, and you see that there are changes, of course. And then, of course, you go from uh, the activity on higher um, frequencies starting to, 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 to increase. There is a, a little increase of higher frequencies in, in the visual in the, the visual channels. But also, you see then this 
uh, the, that the energy of um, decreases at, at a very lower frequencies um, compared to the baseline, um, and, uh, but it's also move a little bit and new bands appear. So here you have a band around theta, and then you see also this uh, change in the in the in the um, in the in the power and shift of alpha activity. When then we compare this with um, with um, the, when we separate those trials, then we see that there are certain differences of this uh, stimulation uh, period. So first of all, though, in, in uh, the, there is a decrease on um, on the lower frequencies. You see that well, not so much of a change of the of at, at the level of, of uh, delta, but then you clearly see that the activity around theta is clearly uh, state dependent, and you have in the high periods more of that theta. Another thing that is important is that uh, you see this shift here of the frequency peak that goes when you don't have a stimulation to a lower frequencies in the alpha range, but there is a different relationship whether the animal is in a low uh, well, um, quite wellfulness or in a high quite wellfulness state. And we didn't see too much of a changes in the power here at these higher frequencies. This type of shift is not very evident on, on, on the parietal channels, most properly uh, observed in the visual channels. We did some characterization of the uh, changes by just taking the, the power, normalize it, and then try to fit cosine, uh, make a cosine fit here to, to, to estimate the, the frequency peak, peak and, and quantify the difference. And then we, we can see here that um, it's around two heads and it moves across the alpha, alpha range. Um, but um, it's clear that with the stimulation you have this decrease of, on, on the peak of, of the alpha, but this change if the animal is in a low or in a high uh, quite wellfulness uh, state. Now, uh, we characterize the power, but then we try to try to understand how those um, uh, areas interact. And since we have several electrodes and those electrodes are placed across the court, we were able to then take all the LFP activity and calculate a measurement of phase relationships. And we use it in um, a metric that is called the weighted phase like index, which allow you to, uh, to estimate phase consistency across trials, but also um, um, without problems of confounding factors provided by uh, volume conduction, volumetric conduction that you can uh, uh, observe when you have measurements of the brain that are too close together. And interestingly, we found here that the um, connectivity uh, the or the phase synchronization of uh, the visual cortex changes much um, around 40 hertz in the period, in the stimulation periods, uh, when when the animal is awake compared with is less awake, and we didn't see too much of a difference um, in other frequency regions. That is what it happened in the visual cortex. In the parietal cortex, on the contrary, we found that these changes occur mostly at lower frequencies, around peak at eight hertz, um, and a little bit of at twenty hertz. But we did not see that high frequency component of phase synchronizations that we observed before. Now, interestingly enough, the coherence between the electrodes um, of these two areas, so the interradial coherence, follow the pattern of the parietal cortex. So there is much more coherence um, observed at these lower uh, frequencies. Then, of course, we focus it on the spikes. And the, uh, the, the focus on the spike was necessary to, to try to understand whether there is any change in the behavior of the neurons, at least, that could bring some potential uh, benefit to the animal to be in one state or on, on the other. And since we presented different ratings here, um, we studied the response of these uh, neurons to the different angles of the gratings. 
and we develop these uh, 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 tuning curves of uh, shows that how the neurons uh, responds um, as a function of the preferred angle. And we put all the preferred angles at zero and then we compare the, the response. And then we see that the animals, of course, um, the, or the neurons have um, increased the firing rate um, um, uh, on those um, uh, presentations of the, pref of the grazing that have the preferred angles for that neurons. So then, then it's when we see then this um, increase of, of, of um, the response. And, and here you can see that, um, that uh, when you take all your neurons, all of the neurons together, we see that uh, a majority and a significant majority of these neurons show this increase of the activity at the preferred angle. Um, um, interestingly, also we see that the, the correlations between the, 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 the spikes goes uh, high when um, the animals are in a high uh, state. So, and, and that did occur immediately after the presentation of the stimulus. But we didn't see many changes of the spike rates now when we put together all the presentations. We see that the, the presentations only occurs when um, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, when, when, when this is the preferred angle. So now the question is, okay, the spikes are showing that there is some, some uh, uh, elements uh, uh, here in which being more awake or the animal being more awake has some benefits on the, on the way that these cells are performing the computations. And also we see some changes in the power structure that shows this global relationship across uh, the two different areas. So it has some, some, some relationship between the activity of these uh, neurons or the spiking activity to that LFP. And to answer that question, well, the first thing that we did was to uh, take um, the, the cells and divide it in this, the, the wave of characterizations. And um, when you do that, you can identify two types of uh, population. One are the fast spiking cells, which are, um, and the regular spiking cells. Uh, you don't see here the regularity, but the fast spiking cells also have a, a narrow, um, a narrow action potentials compared with the regular spiking cells. The important thing is that fast spiking cells always represent interneurons uh, or are um, more identified as an interneurons and the regular spiking cell as pyramidal cells. So when we study how, uh, uh, what is the phase consistency or the spike field coherence of this particular cell population to the uh, cycles of the LFP, um, we can uh, have some answer about how these cells, the activity of the cells are organized in, in these written regimes. Um, the pairwise phase consistency is a type of analysis that allows us to, to study then the spike peak coherence and it's not other uh, metrics or, or the metrics tell you how much uh, uh, phase locking you have at that particular frequency. And here we see that for the fast spiking cells of the interneuron, you see that there is um, um, two uh, uh, oscillatory components in which you see this lock. One, the around uh, uh, ten, uh, the, this low frequency component, and other at a higher frequency component. The regular cells, on the other hand, um, only show this at, or at the high frequency component. Um, uh, that is interesting because um, the uh, and and. I, I hope I have some time to, to that you will understand this in the second part of or 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 my on my talk and the last one because it has it gives to you set an idea how, how about how the circuit is operating and then we see here that different populations lock to different regimes uh, uh, regular spiking cells will be more um, uh, it will more 
uh, locked to this high frequency component, while these ones are also locked to the low frequency component. And already we see that this low frequency component that is coming from, um, um, it's, it's related to the uh, 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 coherence between the uh, parietal area and the visual area. I forgot to mention that these neurons are all neurons from the visual area. So what we are seeing here is the activity, uh, the, um, the locking of the cells in the B1. And in this case, interneurons are very much locked to the rhythm that is coming from uh, parietal regions, low frequency components, while uh, regular spikings are responding to the high frequency components. Um, some conclusions here, um, um, before to go to my last part of the, which I think I'm going to be like around five, six minutes, but what we see here in this spontaneous, uh, uh, we see that the spontaneous pre-stimulus pupil fluctuations correlate with the behavioral state of the animals and can modulate con functional connectivity and visual perception. Uh, we see that the interarial and local connectivity in its hands is enhanced during these high arousal states, and also that these changes are state dependent. And uh, in a local connectivity is predominantly gamma in area 17 and alpha in parietal cortex. And um, uh, the other um, last conclusion that I want just to highlight is that uh, uh, regular spiking and fast spiking cell types are engaged differently. Um, to high and low rhythms during high and low arousal. Now, how then this activity of interneuron shape cortical rhythms or are shaped by cortical rhythm itself? And uh, probably one piece of the puzzle here that is important to say if you are not familiar with this type of research is that the rhythms are much uh, uh, one uh, uh, focus of analysis is how these rhythms are generated and for that it's important to to know that the rhythms are generated by this uh, interaction between excitatory and inhibitory components and of course and, and, and those circuits or the circuits architectures import impose certain rhythms the interneurons we have different types of interneurons that are doing different things and are targeting different aspects of the excitatory cells, as you can see here. And in that sense, we can already see that uh, um, by having certain population, like the regular spikes of pyramidal cells, more locked to a particular rhythm, tells you how then, uh, than, than other, for instance, high frequencies. And knowing that the high frequency component, the gamma, is, is, is generated by the um, interaction between uh, excitation and inhibition can tell you how then you can modulate the activity of these cells depending on the brain state of the animals. And that modulation can be done across um, the modulation of interneurons. And to study that, I want to show very briefly uh, some experiments that we did in mice together with uh, my collaborators, Marielle Miller and Bertolt Chesse, in which we were able to have uh, genetic lines that allow us to stimulate particularly this type of interneurons, the BIP, the SST, or, or the parvalbumin. And we did that with animals that were awake or that were anesthetized. So we have here two different uh, brain states, awake and anesthetized, and we have mice that we can also uh, uh, optically stimulate those neurons and made it active using optogenetics and study how they behave depending on the state of the animal. And to do that, we do recordings in two different areas and we separated those in, um, we did it in somatosensory area and visual area. And also we separated here the electrodes in supragranular, infragranular, I'm sorry, I'm going to show here the cortical column, uh, because, and because we have these uh, laminar uh, probes, we were able to identify electrodes recording supragranular cells, granular cells, and infragranular. And then we calculated the phase, phase of the LFP relationship between these different um, 
layers of the of the co column and areas and that's here you see for instance uh, all the b1 supra uh, granular and uh, sorry um supra granular and infragranular of of somatos somatosensory versus supra granular and infragranular of b1 and here you see all the combinations and then we have this when the animal was awake or it was anesthetized and during periods in which you stimulate the activity of these cells or you don't. And then we see difference that, for instance, these VIP cells are really much, much more um, react uh, and modulate the activity of low frequency components. And that activity, as you can see here, occurs um, a, a, across areas and between different layers. You see that um, mostly occurs in, in all of this. Uh, does not occur when the, an, the animal is anesthetized. You don't see the same pattern of response of the VAP cells. With the SST cells, you see that in awake and, uh, animals, you see an increase of the connectivity across all different frequency bands with the predominant activity of a lower frequency component. Well, lower frequency component is also part of the gamma between 20 and 60 hertz. But again, this activity is altered, but not so much in uh, during anesthetized. And if you take the parallel booming cells, which are also and very much related to the activity of or the generation of these oscillatory rhythms, you see here what happened when the animal is away. You see then this massive increase on the connectivity at all different frequencies but that of course decreases and made it very particular uh, to a particular frequency band when the animal is anesthetized. We are going to, uh, this is um, in progress, but what we wanted to do is to ultimately try to understand how then these transitions can be modulated by this type of, of cells and come with a, 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 a nice uh, overview of what cells are doing to the circuits and how this can change the rhythms and either the brain state of, of, of uh, the brain and behavioral state of the subjects and by with this approach also try to understand the um, the, the changes that I showed you before uh, the, um, when the animal is awake and we are not manipulating the activity of the circuits and with that I would like to finish and answer your questions uh, but before, I would like to just thank my collaborators, so Leanne Claffa, who did the experiments on ferrets, um, Marielle Miller and Tom Sickens, which did the experiments of um, mice, um, Lot Brinkhoff, which was a master student helping Liana to do the experiments in ferrets, and uh, my colleagues at the department, Umberto Chese and Cyril Pennard, and the doctors that were involved in the um, salt epidemic study and ultimately the funding of uh, these experiments that are provided mostly by the human brain project and the flag era um, which is a uh, association in association with the human brain project and with that i would like to say thank you and um, i can stop sharing i think and uh, i'm happy to answer your questions thank you very much thank you so much conrado it was a great talk um, and again, apologies to everyone for my glitch at the beginning. We had some load shedding and it's messing with the signal over here. Um, so I will now hand over to Siobhan, who will start our Q&A session. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for the excellent talk. It was um, very, very interesting. I'm, I'm going to start off with my question and then uh, lead into the others. Um, I am curious about the paradoxical effects of um, zolpidem, um, if it's been observed in healthy subjects as well, and if it has, how does this typically present? Um, no. To be honest, uh, I don't have recollection of uh, paradoxical effects on uh, healthy subjects. Uh, usually, zolpidems work quite well uh, in healthy subjects and produce this hypnotic effect. One thing that it happens that is more, more common um, and that is uh, uh, being um, 
describe it is that patients with Alzheimer or um, uh, or some degenerative diseases, which I guess uh, produce some alteration of the architecture of the circuits, is starting to have these paradoxical re uh, reactions, especially with sulfidem. And I remember from my time of being uh, in the in the in my internship of, um, of medical internal medicine, we were ordered not to give sulfidem the patients in the night because uh, even they, they they couldn't sleep because by giving that they got very much agitated, so um, and very difficult to control. So uh, to answer your questions, apparently, um, and this is not something that I know too much about the, the literature of sulfidem, uh, it's a tricky drug because it can generate uh, paradoxical effects in population that is not entirely normal. Thank and you. A, a good old friend of mine. Oh, yeah. Um, Hi, then I'm going to hand over to you. <laughs> I actually have a sort of comment on the the last answer that you gave because I think that there are now studies uh, coming that uh, actually evaluate paradoxical effects of zolpidem in normal population. I think there was last year a study in France that found like I think a three percent paradoxical effect in healthy controls that all zolpidem users. And uh, I'm actually working on a study that also evaluates that in. Uh, and other other populations now. So there are hints that there could be paradoxical effects in normal populations. That that makes perfect sense because then uh, you you will expect some variability in normal population, and of course then the the effects of topi then can be can be seen there. We should talk more but, often. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> should. <laughs> we definitely um, should. <laughs> Glenn, where are you working? I'm working currently in uh, uh, the Ash. At, in the edge on uh, in the lab of lab of Stephen Laurais of uh, disorders yeah. on consciousness. We, we, so, yeah, Glenn we, was a he, he did a master here at the University of Amsterdam. We worked together. Another data set and uh, yeah, the group of uh, Stephen Laurais has uh, also um, also a very nice paper in pa in patients with other disorders of consciousness. And also the, the changes in, 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 in the spectral signature of those patients, and uh, it was an inspiration for us to do this this analysis on the, the very famous William et al. paper. Yeah, very nice, very nice talk. Also, I, I really liked it. Um, I have some some more questions actually. Um, yeah, so in the in the the patient. Uh, so you saw this paradoxical effect of zolpidem, but does it have any subsequent consequences on sleep or anything that you know of? What we, I don't know, to be honest, because I was not always in contact with the patient and I did not follow his clinical day-to-day -day evolution. But I know that um, what it happens is that he cannot receive the drug uh, in, a, in a regular basis because he developed uh, uh, tolerance and then the effects uh, you don't see the effects he keeps in this acnetic mutism state quite uh, and then you require a period of let's say uh, clearance in order to see then the effects again so then the 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 the, the, the doctors that are uh, decided to give them only um, two or three times per month when he's going to visit the family I um, think that is to visit the dentist, which I feel, which is a very bad option to give to the patient. <laughs> no, no call. But yes, so um, I think at the very end it could happen what you say because it's also happened in the normal population that developed tolerance and that they needed more doses to 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 react. And I think that it has also has to do with. The way of all the biochemical changes that the drugs uh, induces with yeah. more, uh, coming of the coming of um, new receptors and of course that changes the dynamic of the all these uh, populations okay thanks for the answer um i don't know if i should ask my more questions or uh, sure okay um so you also did in the patients you did the pre-post tests 
But have you any idea on how that signal changes over time? Like, is it a gradual change towards more uh, explicit behavior, more communication, or is it like really an, uh, a switch, a critical change? That's a good question, uh, Glenn. I, to be honest, um, I, 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 the data was a little bit noisier, huh? and then it's very difficult to establish that, that kind of line. But um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, despite the fact that it was noisy, it seems to me, but it was more mostly uh, some sort of gradual changes. Though it's something that I, I, I also would like to 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 to, to reevaluate. We we focus it here in a very we, we are trying to focus on the analysis on on the most stable part of the data. There was also they tried to do some tests with the patient, um, but not necessarily the the most uh, relevant or well controlled tests. And, this was not um, was very much made, uh, some sort of ad hoc uh, stimulation once the patient had the, the drug and um, we didn't get it too but much. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that's and, difficult uh, to do any uh, right uh, thing with uh, the patients and data quality will probably be. But I think, and I think it, it's um, for me, it, the, my estimation of the analysis of the data before to go into the more detailed and uh, uh, thorough analysis is that it's, it's more like a gradual changes. Right. And do you think that this is more like uh, a global thing also? Or do you think that in within areas there are also here differences? Like are there areas that come active first or? Yeah, I think uh, it is a combination of two. So you have, you see these global changes with the E which is the best that we can obtain with this patient with this patient but I'm pretty sure that the changes are uh, at the local level and those changes can be very very different and, it's, um, and in that sense I think um, uh, yeah it would be interesting so it would be interesting to see what is going to happen with the deep brain stimulation I'm very very, yeah. looking forward. very looking forward to that as well thanks thank you, thank you Lynn. nice to see you Yes, I actually have one more question, if, if that's allowed. Yeah, go for it. So for yeah, the uh, um, inter-aerial connectivity in the ferret study, so you see that in the visual cortex and in the parietal cortex, yes. there are very different patterns in the, depending of, well, uh, in which frequency the power is more concentrated. But have you also any uh, thoughts on uh, like a cross frequency coupling between these areas or if you look uh, into something uh, like that yeah we have not very uh, so i mean we have not doing some analysis on cross frequency coupling yet because uh, i cross frequency coupling can be tricky sometimes because it can you you know it it it, it, it can also sometimes represent uh, artifacts due to to change it in the amplitude. So we decided to don't go into that much yet, but just to try to focus on, 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 on a mostly phenomenological characterization at that level and to try to, with, the, with what we have at hand, try to propose something. So I would say that what it's, it, it's interesting here is that you, you see that, and you see it here is that something that is also you see in, 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 in another type of recording also with the stimulation that uh, areas on B1, you see this high uh, frequency activity. Yeah, you see that it's a kind of local and it probably fit forward. We did to so we don't have a great a grandeur or directional analysis on the data yet. But then you can see that then um, higher areas you see more this change of the signature to this lower component, and then the coherence uh, also a tricky signal to study is, shows that. The, the, uh, sometimes you see the, 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 the dominance of the sending signal. And it's very interesting to say to see that uh, you see these changes at the lower frequency component. That then, um, and then you see the population that are much one or the other. So that can give some ideas of how the, the circuits are. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the answers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Clint. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for joining us on screen.
Great. I am going to um, jump into Satoshi's question. He's asking us from Norway. So his first question is, how is noise in the recording accounted for? Uh, the increase in, pow in the power uh, can originate from random external covariates or just by random fluctuations. Um, as spe so specifically neurons that aren't associated to the specific task, or what sort of noise do they introduce? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. So, yeah, uh, the noise in the data is usually what you see this one over f noise. Um, you, 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 it, it's very, it's, 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 it's very noticeable. So, um, I guess you can say yes. Um, you can, for instance, have this sort of one over f component, and then you just simply filter that, and then you will get from that noise something, and you can do all this analysis, and you will get some some, some uh, results. I don't think it's the case because we really try to focus on those. Um, Parts of the spectrum in which you have, uh, first of all, we we try to eliminate the one over f component by using a method that subtracts it, and that's what you see the the, the, the power. Um, uh, you see flat power, with, not with this one over f uh, behavior, um, and then uh, it focuses on those areas in which you can see that you have certain noticeable power, which tells you that you have really an oscillatory component which is different from what you see um, uh, pre or post, post post stimulation so I think yes it's a risk um, and of course that, that you can be measured with the noise but at least we we try to take that in consideration by by um, focuses on these areas in which we think we really have um, real induced oscillations or spontaneous oscillations that are there and are noticeable. I hope that answers your, your questions. Yeah, um, the next one is also from Sapta, um, and it was asked during the your, your slide with the phase locking, um, and he's wondering if a Kuramoto order parameter or something likewise is used for determining the phase locking. You noticed uh, there were more than, there were values of greater than um, one. Yeah, I've been reading about this uh, Kura model. I'm not uh, um, super familiar with, but certainly you can. Um, what we're using here is just um, uh, the normal uh, classical approximation of Fourier, in which you just do you take the, 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 the signals and instead of trying to 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 to, to model it or try to find a model. Um, you can uh, uh, you can uh, yeah just just work with the signal. Now that being said, I would say that uh, some people are using Kuramoto models, but also you can use Wilson Cohen models, which also are very good to characterize uh, oscillatory components and uh, this type of, of frequencies. And yes, um, and that is important because. As other modelers can 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 tell you, um, then you can really see what are the, uh, the the how you can by modifying certain parameters you can obtain either uh, um, a, a meaningful phase relationship there or it's just something related to to the the way that these these signals are, are generated. Um, so I would say yes, it's um, um, Kuda model models can be used, uh, Wilson Cohen models also can be used and are very important to, to study and understand. Great. Then our last question is from Cassandra, who is asking about classifying quiet wakefulness in mice. Uh, so she says, uh, and ferrets. Uh, I know classifying quiet wakefulness for mice from EEG has been quite difficult and is not fully established. And thus, if ferrets also have fragmented sleep, this could be hard to tell. Can you that show is, in the other, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. I think, yeah, um, these microstates exist. And also I've been analyzing 
um, if Glenn is there, he could remember that because we did it together when he was master stu uh, student here. We analyzed it in micro micro stage of sleep in in patients, and I'm pretty sure the animals can do that. And this is a passive task. So the animal is there and he's just receiving visual stimulation, and um, then. Um, uh, uh, of course, it, since there is not really uh, an association with what he's seeing and uh, what he can obtain, the reward, uh, it, it's very easy to get this animal disengaged. So, and then you can see then those microstates. But we try to at least uh, restrict our, our, our analysis of quite wellfulness on those periods in which we, we, were, we were really clear that the pupil was there and we would, we would see that the pupil and there was and some engagement of the animals. And also we can see that the fluctuations goes, uh, uh, changes across um, the period quite rapidly. Um, and that not really related to the luminance because we control about that. So um, yes, there could be those, say, but we try to focus on these two quintiles of the distribution of pupil uh, Permits is trying to say, okay, given that condition of the animal in which is doing something super boring for the animal, which not necessarily will engage the animal into an active behavior, um, we can see fluctuations and then we choose these two extremes. Probably there are microstates there, probably the death activity that you see um, has something to do with that, but despite the fact that we have that, still we have um, a lot of modulations given one on the one hand because of the stimulation and on the other by, by, by just, just changes of states. So, yeah. But this is a good point and I think it's necessary to clarify. Thanks. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to wrap up the, the question uh, period then. Thank you so much uh, for the excellent talk and uh, answering all our questions. And, and enjoy it and uh, thank you for, for your attention. Yeah. Oh, uh, Julianne, you're muted. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> thank you, Siobhan. Um, yeah, I was just saying thank you from my side as well, Conrado. It was a great talk. And let's give Conrado another virtual round of applause in the comments. And also for all of you, please do subscribe to NERV's mailing list and calendar if you haven't already. Siobhan will share those links in the comments just now. And thank you to all of you for attending. And then we will see you again next time. Yeah. Thank you and good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.